Okay, so on behalf of Summit for Stem Cell Foundation, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a discussion about Proposition 14, the Stem Cell Initiative. My name is Dr. Suzanne Peterson, and I am the Chief of Regenerative Medical Operations at the Summit for Stem Cell Foundation. And I am a scientist, a patient advocate, and a caregiver for two people with Parkinson's, my father and my husband. Um, so this initiative is very important to me, and I thank you so much for joining the conversation about it. I'd like to give you a little bit more information about Summit for Simpson for Foundation before we start. So next slide, please. So at Summit for Stem Cell Foundation, our mission is to support, educate, and raise awareness about the development of today's and tomorrow's evidence-based regenerative medical therapies focused on Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. It's our goal to empower patients and caregivers with information, to elevate their understanding in order to manage their healthcare. Next slide, please. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, and we provide reliable information about stem cells and evidence-based regenerative medical research. We have three main programs, the first of which is our research grant program, where we provide support for evidence-based regenerative medical research. We also provide fellowships. Our second program is our educational programs. And the goal here is to bridge the information gap between science and medical communities. And we want to include patients. We're featuring our continuing medical education webinar series um, and on November 18th, we will have Dr. Peter Marks, who is the director of the FDA Center for Biologics, Biologics Evaluation and Research. So please check on our website for more information about that. Our third program is our patient assistance program, for which we provide education empowering patients with the knowledge to make informed choices. We also provide financial assistance to patients who want to enroll in evidence-based and uh, regenerative medical clinical trials. Given the importance of exercise in Parkinson's disease, we are also supporting a virtual fitness challenge building bridges one mile at a time for a victory over Parkinson's. This will start November 14th, and you can look at our website to uh, register, and that begins on November 7th. And our website is www.summitforstemcell.org. Next slide, please. So this is our webinar policy. You can also find this on our website. And if you have any questions about it, you can direct it to the address listed there. Next slide. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Bernie Siegel Esquire. He has been a mover and shaker in the stem cell field for many years. He is the executive director of the nonprofit Regenerative Medicine Foundation. He has conceptualized, created, and co chaired 17 annual World Stem Cell Summits. So that's, that's quite impressive. Um, he also serves on numerous boards Americans for Cures and also Californians for uh, Stem Cell Research Treatments and Cures. So he is very well qualified to moderate this discussion and I'm gonna hand it off to his very capable hands. Thank you so much, Bernie. 
Thank you, Suzanne, and thanks, thanks to the Summit for Stem Cell Foundation, uh, Summit for Stem Cell Foundation, a great organization with a byline of victory over Parkinson's. Um, Justice Louis Brandeis in 1932 famously said in an opinion, states are the laboratories of democracy. And we need to remember that as we discuss uh, Prop 14, the ballot measure that's coming up, a $5.5 billion ballot measure. But before we go and look to the future of Prop 14, we have to talk a little bit about Prop 71. Proposition 71 uh, was the $3 billion uh, bond initiative in 2004 that resulted in the creation of the California Institute of Reg for Regenerative Medicine. And I must say, in the history of patient advocacy, there's been nothing like this. I remember when I was starting the advocacy journey in 2004, 2003, actually, and I read the proposition, putting on my lawyer's hat. I was so amazed that this thing could be born whole cloth to create an entire state agency for the state of California. But I called up a close friend of mine that was putting together a seminar in the Practicing Law Institute in New York, who immediately invited me up to be able to give a lecture on this astonishing proposition that was uh, a scientific experiment, an economic experiment, a social experiment, nothing like it. And when you think about advocacy movements, you think about things like uh, Mary Lasker and creating and building up the American Cancer Society. And uh, she thought disease was like sin that needed to be uh, fixed. And you think about the polio vaccine and millions of uh, parents offering up their children for a clinical trial to get this vaccination. You think about the AIDS HIV movement the breast cancer movement, where we are all wearing pink ribbons. This is an advocacy movement that is audacious and has changed the trajectory of the future of medicine. Michael West, Dr. Michael West, when he first looked at embryonic stem cells in a microscope uh, in the 1990s, he saw what he described as nuclear fission in a dish. This is so powerful cells living as living drugs. This is a paradigm shift. And what we all have to remember in scientific revolutions that used to take decades or centuries in our lifetimes with the convergence of technologies, these things are available to us now, a new platform for medicine cell therapies that might actually offer cures. So before I introduce our distinguished guests, that I'm really thrilled, and I know I know all of them, a couple I've just met recently, but I think the world of them and some I've had uh, extensive dealings with. I want to talk to you a little bit about Proposition 14. Uh, certainly the accomplishments of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, Melissa King will address some of those uh, accomplishments. But Prop 14, which is coming up in the, the next uh, election very shortly, as we all know, uh, authorizes $5.5 billion in state general obligation bonds to continue stem cells research and development and delivery of treatments in California. It will accelerate treatments and achieve cures for chronic conditions. Among those listed is cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, lower respiratory disease, spinal cord injuries, blindness, MSC, HIV, AIDS, kidney disease, infectious diseases, such as COVID. And now, in a time of existential crisis and public health emergency, this research is needed more than, more than ever. Of course, uh, also, they are, this initiative is focused on diseases of the brain and chronic conditions such as Parkinson's disease, which is very relevant, of course, to the group that's organizing this particular webinar. $1.5 billion for diseases of the brain. There are all different aspects of this, including something that will build up workforce development, a critical unmet need for this burgeoning new industry that's revolutionizing biomedicine. We have to have the skilled technicians 
to be able to do the job. CIRM has created a bridges program. They've created alpha clinics. And th this will need to move forward. Prop 71 and Prop 14 are part of an evolution. And the key is, is that we have a start. But now, all these years later, technologies have advanced. We understand the obstacles now. And this is the story of Prop 14 and whether it will be the wisdom of the voters of the state of California to move forward with this or not. So let me take a moment to introduce all of our distinguished guests. And I have to reboot my iPad in order to do so. Um, we have as one our first speaker today, and I'm going to introduce everyone uh, first before Melissa speaks, is Melissa King, Ex Executive Director for American Cures. Melissa is a passionate advocate for patients of chronic illness and disease, as well as medical research that can help reduce their suffering. She is currently head of field operations for the Yes on 14 Californians for Stem Cell Research Treatments and Cures ballot measure on the November 3rd ballot. Of course, I know Melissa is a good friend and a speaker in last October's World Stem Cell Summit in Shanghai, China. That's when we were still talking to China. And I remember that Melissa spoke extensively on Proposition 71, Proposition 14, and CIRM, which was of intense interest to our Asian audience. It's no surprise because of the impact that this has had. Also joining us today is David Jensen. He's a retired California newsman, hardly retired, I'd say, who's followed <laughs> the affairs of the $3 billion California Stem Cell Agency and published the California Stem Cell Report blog with some 4,000, 5,000 entries over the years. Uh, he has also recently published a new book, which I am about halfway through, and it's great. It's called California's Great Stem Cell Experiment, an inside look at $3 billion search for cures. Because of the study that this man has done in this field, he isn't loved by everyone. He isn't hated by everyone. But I'll tell you something, the guy has diligently reported everything about this uh, field in California. And for that, we, and his constancy of purpose, we all thank you, David, for that. Our third speaker will be Jean Loring, who's Professor Emeritus at Scripps Research Institute, where she was founding director of the Center for Regenerative Medicine. She is also founder of Arcos Bioscience, now part of Biosite, an Aspen Neuroscience, a biotechnology company, developing a neuron replacement therapy for Parkinson's disease. Dr. Loring has more than 30 years experience in both biotechnology and academic research, focusing on stem cells, genomics, embryology and neurology. She has received many CIRM grants for her brilliant work. Of course, I have called Jean, when I've introduced her at the World Stem Cell Summit, is the most interesting person in the world. She, what she does for fun is chase eclipses around the planet. And because of Jean's work, she is uh, working on uh, making sure the northern white rhino doesn't go extinct. I guess those little IPS cells are going to go pretty far, Gene. Um, we have a wonderful patient advocate joining us, uh, Kristen McDonald. Uh, Kristen is a patient advocate, an advocate for Americans for Cures, an actress whose life was changed by a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative eye condition, which almost took all of her eyesight. Kristen is a participant in a stem, bell ba stem cell based trial at University of California, Irvine, and now sees more light than she has in a decade. And my few dealings with her, I found her to be incredibly witty and a very interesting person. So I'm looking forward to learning more. And as our final speaker, before we will all have a, there are five minutes of presentations before we'll have a general discussion, is Judy Roberson. Roberson. Judy um, represents Huntington's disease. And one of the most singular, important, and impactful moments in my career as a stem cell advocate was meeting Judy at the World Stem Cell Summit in Pasadena. And that's what exposed me to understanding what the burden and the challenges of families with Huntington's disease. 
We honored the grassroots Huntington's community with the Stem Cell Action Award at the 2014 World Stem Cell Summit in San Antonio. Judy has made such an impact. She's been a volunteer patient advocate for Huntington's disease for nearly 40 years. Um, uh, Judy serves as the president of the Joseph P. Robertson Foundation. This small 501c3 began 28 years ago. It founded and continues to fund the Huntington's Disease Center for Excellence Clinic at UC Davis in Sacramento under the direction of founding director, Dr. Vicki Wheelock, neurologist. Although the gene for HD was found in 1993, there remains not one therapy. Huntington's disease affects the same number of Americans such as ALS. Children can be affected too. Judy is an advocate for stem cell research and serum in her own family has been severely impacted by this disease. So I wanna welcome all of you to this seminar. And we're gonna start off this uh, webinar with a poll. And you should see popping up on your screen, if our technology works right, a poll question. If you were to vote right now, before this webinar, how would you vote on Proposition 14? Yes or no? I'll give you a few seconds to click, find your cursor and click yes, no, or undecided. We'll give you the answer at the end of the webinar. Okay, let me now uh, welcome to the webinar, Melissa King. Please tell us about where we've been and where we're going. Thank you, Bernie, for that uh, great introduction of the entire panel. Wow, oh, what a group. I almost wanna just not say anything and hear what everybody else has to say. I'm, I'm so excited to hear from everybody. And I wanna start by thanking uh, the wonderful team at Summit for Stem Cell, Jennifer, who's been such a partner to Americans for Cures and has done so much for patients everywhere, particularly the Parkinson's community. As she lives as a person with Parkinson's herself, she's just amazing and leads the organization brilliantly. And also Suzanne, who I've known for many years since she was in Dr. Loring's lab, and it's such a pleasure to encounter her uh, choosing to work as a scientist in science and, and uh, patient advocacy. Uh, so yes, I'm here to talk with you today about uh, Prop 71 and CIRM, a little bit of the history. And if I could have the next slide, please. And if we could go all the way through the slide, that would be great. So as Bernie already mentioned, Prop 71 was passed in California in 2004, a ballot initiative much like Prop 14 this year. And it was passed with 59% of the vote, which is a very strong yes vote. You need 50 plus one. 59% is a very strong endorsement for a ballot initiative. And the most important thing to know about getting Proposition 71 passed in 2004 to a lot $3 billion toward this research is that it really happened because of patient advocates and patient advocacy organizations. It was built by, for, and created by patient advocates. Next slide, please. So if, if we could go all the way through this, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so what, what has CIRM's impact been? To put it into context, I wanna start by talking about the clinical trials that are now being funded by CIRM and some others that are happening around California for which earlier stage research was funded by CIRM. The significance of that is, as Bernie mentioned, this field has evolved in the past 15 years and CIRM was a big part of that. And these clinical trials were not possible 15 years ago, but now they are. And now babies are being saved from baby bubble disease. People who are suffering from different types of blindness, including one of the wonderful advocates that we will hear from today, Kristen McDonald, are in clinical trials and getting their sight back. Cancer patients, including and especially cancer patients with various forms of blood cancer, are being kept alive by drugs that have been funded by CIRM, the early stage research funded by CIRM, leading to approved drugs all the way through the research pipeline. 
We have two of those. Now, four of the clinical trials are in phase three, which means they are getting close to approval by the FDA. You can't make any promises about science. It's not predictable necessarily. It's not on any particular timeline. You can't hold it to a timeline, nor can you say definitively before it happens that something in science will actually come to pass. But having four shots on goal pretty close to the end in phase three in FDA process clinical trials is a pretty amazing place to be. I don't need to read you what else is, is on the slide, but for those only able to listen, I will say CIRM has also funded research that's led to more than 3,000 peer-reviewed publications in top journals like Science and the New England Journal of Medicine. And as Bernie mentioned, we've trained with CIRM funding. Californians are responsible for training medical residents, 2,200 medical residents and fellows that didn't know how to work on stem cell therapies and now do. And we've also trained over 1,200 students to be part of the biomedical research and the biotech industry workforces. Next slide, please. So just briefly, what has been CIRM's economic impact? Just in California alone, we've created 55,000 jobs, and these are conservative estimates. We have, uh, we've, had, we've seen $10.7 billion in additional gross output in the state by further funds being driven by CIRM-funded research, and we've seen $640 million in additional state and local tax revenue. We've had the same impact on the entire U.S. economy, um, not on the same scale, of course, but and that's because CIRM-funded research, while it has to happen in California, partnerships by CIRM-funded researchers drive jobs, drive research, and drive activity in other states as well through partnerships that leads to the numbers that you're seeing on the screen. It's also led to more than 40 companies being spun out. And by the way, this is important. We need our biotech industry to ultimately bring these therapies to patients. When they, once they are already through the FDA process or sometimes just before that, they'll fund the, the clinical trials themselves. Um, and, and that includes Aspen Neuroscience that, that Jean Loring, who you'll hear from later, founded herself. And so, and uh, Jean is, is one of the earliest recipients of, of CIRM grant funds, a training grant while she was at Scripps, and also uh, her, her wonderful research that has led to uh, Aspen Neurosciences being able to work on treatments and cures, uh, cure hopefully for Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. Just very briefly, Bernie already told you about it, but we have Prop 14 on the ballot. We're asking for $5.5 billion to renew the funding for this treasure that we have in our state. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Once again, this uh, effort is supported by over 200 organizations, many of them patient advocacy and medical organizations. You can see the logos of some of them on the screen. And yes, you see Summit for Stem Cell. If I can see the next slide, please. And so this is just another slide showing logos of the many organizations that are supporting this initiative. That includes the Regents of the University of California among our many, many wonderful uh, patient and medical advocacy organizations. And this is just to stress that the mission of CIRM and the mission of Prop 14 is to advance research and develop therapies for patients, for patients everywhere. Everything else is secondary. We can talk about it. There's a lot more to it. But the mission is to advance research and develop therapies for patients. And if I could have my final slide, please. Thank you. So this is our website. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to cafortures.com or you can contact me. And I'm happy to share with you whatever information you'd like to have. And I, I hope many of you will vote yes on 14 on either November 3rd or sooner. We know a lot of you are voting sooner. So thank you for taking the time to be here today. And I'll turn it back over to you, Bernie. Well, thank you, Melissa. So I'm going to call up our next speaker, and I just want to remind David Jensen that you're on the record, David. Anything you say, you know, might show up in who knows where. Listen, terrific. Thank you for joining us, uh, David Jensen. Uh, thank you, Bernie, uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, and, you know, I was expecting you, you to tell me that anything I say can and will be held against me. Uh, but at any rate, uh, 
this has been an interesting 15 years for me, or nearly 16 years at this point, uh, to write about the California Stem Cell Agency because it is a unique entity in California history, and it is unique across the country in terms of states. No, no agency has ever existed like this in California history, and it, it, no other state has financed stem cell research or scientific research to this extent, to a multi-billion dollar extent. And, uh, and no other state has used an initiative to do this, which is an interesting thing in California. It doesn't exist in every state, for those of you who are not familiar, but it's a direct democracy tool, uh, which has uh, existed for over 100 years. And in fact, the chief advocate for uh, the initiative and getting it into the California Constitution was a medical doctor in Los Angeles. Uh, he also believed in <coughs> government control of utilities, government ownership of utilities, which is sort of interesting. But that's another story. And uh, I was in Mazatlan at the time that I was reading about the results of the California election. Uh, it was 2004, it was November. Uh, there was a big presidential election like there is, well, not bigger than this one, <laughs> this presidential election, which is the biggest. But I had been following the, uh, the presidential election somewhat, but lost track of what was going on in California. So after the election, I was catching up about uh, with California measures, and I ran across online a headline that was, I believe, in the Washington Post, and there were similar headlines in other papers, and it was George Will's column talking about a gold rush a stem cell gold rush coming to California, which sort of provoked me. I was very interested in this. I wanted to know more, and so I dug around. And I found that, uh, that this is a, an agency that uh, combines within one state department, big government, big science, big academia, life, death, morality, ethics, and all of those things in one entity, which is, it, it, Pretty unusual for a state agency. And uh, so I dug into it and uh, I'll, uh, scratched around on the internet and started to follow it. And since I knew about doing a blog, I, writing was not the hard part. And, and that was the beginning of the story about what has been a fascinating tale, at least to people uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the area of biomedical research and in uh, government policy, because it's a very important of public policy initiative, which uh, may uh, have implications uh, that uh, go down the road and uh, uh, lead to other developments. Uh, one thing before I go too much farther is that I am not taking a position on Proposition 14. I neither am for it or against it. Uh, I cover it and write about it all, every almost every day, and so I think it's very important to uh, be in a neutral position about that. Uh, but as I look at it and uh, I think about it, I think there are three pretty essential questions that any voter should think about uh, in terms of voting yes or no on this thing. Uh, and those key questions are, one, has proposition, uh, has the stem cell agency fulfilled the, pro the promises and expectations of voters in 2004? Uh, the second question is, how do you as a voter uh, expect the agency uh, to perform over the next 10 to 15 years, which is about the lifetime of, of this uh, bond, uh, of, of the financing. And then you, another, the third question is, how does uh, Proposition 14 and the Stem Cell Agency fit in the uh, priorities for California over the next 10 to 15 years, uh, which raises some real interesting questions uh, given the nature complex nature of the issues facing the state. Uh, yesterday, we were organizing this uh, little endeavor here. Uh, and uh, uh, the question was, is uh, what about the opposition arguments? And sort of there was a little discussion of that and got passed around a little bit. And so here I am, I'm a surrogate for the opposition. So I will offer up some of the, some of the uh, summary of what the opposition has to say about this. And then we will go back to the, some of these essential questions. I don't think you know, Melissa did a fine job of, of summarizing uh, many of the comp, uh, accomplishments of the agency, which are very significant. It's, uh, and one thing I just wanted to reflect, there's a paper out that uh, was published just this month about, uh, about the stem cell agency in a scientific journal. And it noted 
uh, that in 2004, globally, there were only three uh, 132 uh, uh, papers published about stem cell research, 132 papers in 2004. And since then, 3,000 papers have been published as a result of, of, of research financed by the stem cell agency. Needless to say, that's only a small percentage of what exists around the world. So you can see that there has been a, a, an enormous impact, a lot of a, a tremendous upsurge in interest in research and development of the field. And CERN has certainly been part of that and it came along at a time when it was pretty gloomy uh, in, in the stem cell field. Uh, there were scientists who left the country because of the Bush administration restrictions and took their research to the UK and Singapore. Uh, and CERN has been a little light in the window uh, during that time. But to go back to uh, the, the uh, objections that, uh, that the opposition has, uh, I think first and foremost, we have to recognize the religious uh, objections to this. Uh, those are a matter of faith. They're personal. They are not subject to much examination in terms of uh, questioning people's faith. They either believe or you don't believe. And of course, that is the judgment that uh, uh, this sort of research involves the death of a human being. And uh, uh, it's, it's fundamental and very powerful for the people who uh, hold those beliefs. Uh, another one that has surfaced more recently, particularly during the Obama administration, is when the Obama administration, President Obama, lifted the restrictions, uh, the Bush restrictions, and so those have vanished. And there were questions raised then about whether CERN uh, uh, was a bit redundant at the time. Those, those questions are rising again, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, question is, how does this proceed? How, is, how does this kind of uh, research proceed uh, uh, without the uh, presence of CERN? The answer is, the opponents say, is the NIH is there, the uh, public sector is there, in a way that they just weren't there in 2004, and actually for a number of years thereafter. There's a more interest in, than ever. Uh, this, this question about uh, you know of private interest is uh, is important. Jonathan Thomas, who's the chairman of the CERN board, uh, pretty much at every meeting uh, uh, tells its the board members about how the interest is increasing in, in uh, stem cell research, uh, which leads, and of course, that is a, an opportunity for CERN to capitalize on and finance. Uh, uh, critical areas of the research, but it's also another, has another edge, which uh, even some of the board members have mentioned is uh, that uh, the private sector is putting out money in a way that uh, they didn't, uh, uh, they were just not there in 2004. So the question is, does, is, there, is there enough money coming from the private sector? Uh, the NIH, of course, is, uh, is, has spent a lot of money on the stem cell research, particularly in recent years. Uh, but, you know, it's very competitive. The NIH is not an unlimited, uh, uh, have unlimited resources and uh, it's always uh, uh, fighting for funds with the uh, uh, Congress uh, and to, to provide uh, support for the existing research levels. And the unlimited demand, I mean, there's always never enough money for stem, um, or stem cell research or for any research, uh, particularly when, when you see it. Uh, coming at the um, NIH. Uh, another uh, objection that uh, comes about is the initiative process itself. The initiative is, uh, is uh, well, it's direct, direct democracy and it was designed to uh, give uh, the people of California a uh, way around corrupt politicians and during, at the turn of the 20th century, back in the oh, turn of the 19th century, whatever you want to call it, uh, the, the uh, government of California was dominated by a railroad interest largely, and uh, there was a uh, real revolt, and they needed to find some way to limit the uh, uh, influence of, of industries like the railroad uh, uh, at, at railroads at the time. And so this thing came about. Uh, well, what happens is it has happened here with the initiative process. It's very difficult to change it once you and and. Proposition 71 and Proposition uh, 14 are examples. You either have to go to an initiative or you have a very tedious, almost politically impossible way to uh, change even the most minor uh, things and in, in errors in the, in the drafting of, uh, of uh, 
or proposition or initiative. And that's that has led to only one major uh, in the legislature over the last 15 years that did modify some features of, of the, the, the of Proposition 71. And uh, finally, we come to the matter of conflicts of interest. Uh, but before I do that, I want to I uh, 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 provide a nod to the patient advocacy role on the board of, uh, of the stem cell agency. There are 29 members of the board. 10 of those members are patient advocates. They sit at the book table, they vote, they aren't there as consultants or advisors, they actually vote uh, uh, until quite recently. The vice chairman of the science committee or, uh, was a, a patient advocate. Uh, he also led uh, the patient uh, or the discussion uh, uh, or discussion of applications uh, when they came up for final approval by, by the full board. But uh, there are a number of, of, of uh, board members who have uh, ties with institutions that have received a substantial amount of funding. In fact, uh, over the last 15 years, $2.1 uh, uh, billion has given, been given out in uh, grants to uh, members of institutions who have links to members on the board. That's uh, uh, something that has disturbed a number of uh, uh, opponents, both uh, and supporters. The Institute of Medicine, which was, gave, uh, described the uh, uh, term as a bold social innovation, uh, also recommended major changes in the board structure in order to uh, deal with the question of, of, uh, of conflicts of interest. Uh, we should keep in mind, however, that the individual board members cannot vote on applications to uh, or uh, applications submitted by their institutional members, but they do uh, take full. Uh, they do participate entirely in the um, uh, approval of what are called concept plans, which make decisions about the direction, overall direction of the uh, nature of the grants and what areas to explore. Um, so now let's just go quickly back to expectations of uh, um, 2004. Uh, Michael J. Fox. David, David uh, as, the, as the moderator in our limited time, we're going to have a closeout uh, discussion, but just to let our other panelists give their uh, presentations, may we get back to the points that you made in our closing discussion? Yes. I, I appreciate it. I, uh, interestingly, I was a reviewer of the Institute of Medicine report, which was right. very, very uh, interesting, and uh, well, hopefully we can discuss that some more. Thank you, David. And let me uh, now welcome uh, uh, Jean Loring, who uh, will be discussing the science and more. Thank you, Jean. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Bernie. I'll be quick. Um, so I am um, a researcher, a stem cell researcher in California. Um, I first started working on human embryonic stem cells in 1997. And in 2001, um, stem cell lines that I had derived were approved for funding by the federal government, uh, by uh, George Bush. And 2003, I had two grants from the NIH. So um, there was only one other person in California who had already made embryonic stem cells when uh, Prop uh, 71 uh, arose. Uh, that was Roger Peterson at uh, UCSF. So. Um, there were very few of us, and he he left shortly after that, and so leaving me the only uh, sort of historical figure here in uh, early stem cell research. Um, over the course of the last 15 years, I've uh, I've received um, 10 grants from CIRM as a, a principal investigator, and five more or so um, as a co-investigator with my colleagues in California. So uh, CIRM has been uh, a, a great supporter of my research and I'm, and I'm very, uh, I couldn't have done it any other way. Um, so I owe CIRM everything that I have done over the last uh, 15 years, um, along with others like Summit for Stem Cell who came through with funding for my Parkinson's disease project back when it was not fundable by other agencies. So it wasn't just CIRM, but I think they, the, all the work that was funded by CIRM enabled me to get funding from other sources. And I um, 
ended up in 2018, I started a company called Aspen Neuroscience. Uh, we raised uh, $6.5 million in startup funds right away. And then uh, just at the beginning of this year, we raised another $70 million to carry our therapy through to, um, to clinical trials. So in that way, I'm sort of a poster child, as uh, Melissa was mentioning, uh, for the intentions of CIRM, that is to get um, a infrastructure of stem cell research in California and to carry it through um, and ob obtain other funding in order to um, take the, uh, our research to the clinic. I think I'm gonna stop there, Bernie. We can talk about other things later. You're muted, Bernie. I'll get that skill set eventually, sometime next year. Anyway, I unmuted. Uh, sorry about that. So, Kristen McDonald, uh, welcome, and please uh, share some of your uh, story and your passion for advocacy. Thank you, Bernie. I'd be happy to. Hello to everyone, and I'm delighted to be here tonight. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to first thank my wonderful friend, Jennifer Robb. She's such an inspiration to all of us and the people, the board of directors for Summit uh, for organizing this great webinar tonight. And of course, CIRM for all that they've done and Americans for Cures, Cures, I'm getting a little, <laughs> five, six o'clock tonight, Cures uh, for everything they've done in the area of stem cell research thus far. So before I tell you a little bit about what it was like for me to be the first patient in many parts of the world to have stem cells in her eyes, I'd like to give you a little description of what my first vision of life was like. Excuse me. I grew up with 20-20 vision in a suburb in New Jersey riding horses, and horses were my passion. I couldn't wait to get to the stables every day. And in my mid-20s, I had finished school and was pursuing a dream, a beautiful dream of becoming an actress and a talk show host and moved out to the West Coast. But little did I know that I was getting accused of being legally blonde uh, because I was becoming ditzy and my night vision was failing me. And later I found out, of course, that I was legally blind. So after my second broken arm at an NBC cast party, I ended up uh, breaking my arm and ended up in a real cast, no pun intended, I discovered that I either had a brain tumor or was going to go blind from a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. And I was 29, 30 years old at the time. So you can just imagine watching all of your dreams just burst in front of you. It was very devastating and scary. And it was compounded by the fact that the doctor who diagnosed me lacked a lot of empathy and told me to buck up and deal the life that, dealt, that had been dealt to me when he saw me crying in his chair. So fortunately, a few months later, I found a wonderful, caring ophthalmologist and he helped to change my attitude about reinventing myself. So I soon got busy and worked behind the scenes in Hollywood and took up mobility training and independent living skills and learned how to cook when I was slowly going blind. And I lost my fight to the white cane when I fell down a flight of stairs head first with my actress friend on top of me at the Academy of Television and Arts and Sciences. Having retinitis pigmentosa is kind of like watching a beautiful movie fade over the years. It's almost like a Monet painting in front of you and slowly it looks like a donut and all the colors start to fade and the people around you start to fade and the colors start to fade. And as I was going blind, I kept wondering what will it be like, you know, when it comes to the point where I can't see the faces of the people that I love. And now I know what that's like. I've never seen my boyfriend's face. Hopefully there's still time for that for me in the future when the stem cell, when I get the next round of stem cells. I wanted to make an analogy early on and that is, you know, we all have a vision for our lives and often they don't turn out the way they think it's going to. Man plans and God laughs. And COVID-19 is a perfect example of that. COVID-19 is kind of a little bit like going blind. Everything is being taken from us. We can't be with the people that we want to be with. We can't do the things that we love to do. And so, you know, going blind didn't come with an instruction booklet for me, but I slowly had to learn to work on my attitude. So I started to take up salsa dancing to stay happy. And then I started raising money for everything under the sun that, was, that had to do with vision loss. And 
it was about five years ago when I got a phone call uh, saying that I would be the first person in a clinical trial and I was over the moon to get this news after waiting about 30 years for someone to say we have something that we think is safe and that we can try it on you. So I got an injection in my left eye, a half a million cells five years ago and two years following that I got a million cells in my right eye and as many of you know the first study is only for safety so no one really no one knew what was going to happen. But lo and behold, two and a half months after the study, I went into my, my, my bathroom to put on my makeup and I noticed how bright the world was. And I noticed that I could see the image in the mascara wand on the right side. And I noticed that when I went outside, I needed sunglasses and that I could suddenly see a van across the street that was just an image for me before that. And I could see the color blue when I stood by a pool. So all of those things were just unbelievable. It was like a high to me. And other people in the study have reported, I have a close friend, she can now see me, she had the injections of retinitis of uh, stem cells and was after me in the study, she had a higher dose. And now she can see me on the iPad and she can see me on FaceTime, she can see me when she's in my house, she can see her husband's face. And other people in the study have reported continuous progress over a two year period. So all of this is so exciting. The only reason why I haven't gotten my next injection is because of COVID-19. So blindness is a lesson in patience. It will happen, it will happen soon when the lab restrictions are lifted. But you know, when I worked in television, I worked with Christopher Reeves before I knew I was going blind. I was producing telethons and I remember handing him a, a, a cue card one day that said, you're only one step away from a disability. And I wish that Superman were here today to see the progress that CIRM has made with spinal cord injuries, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, the bubble boy disease, as Melissa mentioned, There's, the list goes on. And to see the hope that it's given to people like myself, I no longer go to sleep at night worrying that I'm going to be in darkness. I navigate better in the world now because of the light and I have hope every single day that I know I'll have a chance to see all of you on Zoom or on, on an iPad next year. So people often, I never thought that my life and my future would depend on politics, but people often change their minds like Nancy Reagan did when it, when it happened to her husband, when he got Alzheimer's, she suddenly changed her mind on stem cell therapy. So you people out there tonight have a chance to be a change maker. That's the positive thing. And I urge you tonight when you go to sleep to please do a little meditation and just, pretend what it's like to be blind. It's a lesson in gratitude and I do it and I pretend that I can't hear because things could be worse for me. So I, I ask you please vote on Prop 14, vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That was amazing. Christopher Reeve also played an important part in my advocacy, advocacy and the journey. Mm, uh, beautiful person. Judy Robertson is next. You've had an amazing journey, Judy. And would you share some of it with us, please? Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hey, I'm going to uh, just read my notes because I'm not a professional speaker. I'm just a regular person pleading for therapies and cures. In 2004, I voted enthusiastically for Prop 71 which created the California Stem Cell Agency known as CIRM. It was a breakthrough, first time ever program that circumvented the federal government's restriction on stem cell research. And now, 16 years later, I enthusiastically vote yes for Prop 14, which will continue the mission of CIRM to fund research for diseases with unmet medical needs. Unmet medical needs is a medical jargon that stands for, there are no treatments for your disease and there are none expected in the near future. That's a hand that was dealt to my young husband, 30, he was 39 years old. He was diagnosed with Huntington's disease by a kind Sacramento neurologist in 1992. Sadly, we left his office without being given a return follow-up appointment. 
my husband died at home in a hospital bed 12 years later without one clinical trial or therapy available. Now here we are, <clears throat> 17 years later, there's still not one therapy for HD, but because of CIRM, <clears throat> there's a pioneering novel potential therapy preparing to go to the FDA. This research is a collaboration between dedicated and brilliant HD researchers at UC Davis and UC Irvine stem cell programs, which by the way, are funded by CIRM. All of this research is fully funded by CIRM. And I wanna say this word, continuity, without additional funding from CIRM, this pioneering HD research will abruptly end. I often say, hope costs money because nothing happens without money. I wanna tell you a little bit about Huntington's disease. A legendary folk singer, Woody Guthrie, who wrote the beloved song, This Land Is Your Land, died from HD in 1967. He was 55. HD is a genetic terminal brain disease caused by just one faulty gene. It's best described as having Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, and MS all at the same time. And it affects children too. We call that juvenile HD. Many call Huntington's disease the worst disease, a scourge on humanity. Oh, it is. And although the gene for HD <clears throat> was found in 1993, here we are, 27 years later, still no therapies. CIRM's our big hope. <clears throat> These are uncertain times in the federal government with anti-science sentiments, which could lead to limitations of stem cell research once again. It's prudent to continue the remarkable work of CIRM now through funding Prop 14. Chronic long-term neuro diseases like HD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, et cetera, they bankrupt families every day and they threaten to bankrupt our government too. We simply can't afford to not fund stem cell research. I'll conclude with the famous and still relevant quote, quote by Mary Lasker, founder of the Lasker Foundation in New York. If you think research is expensive, try disease. And I say, please vote yes on Proposition 14 to continue California's stem cell funding. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Judy. That was, uh, that was remarkable. So um, we have some questions from the audience. Um, and I'm gonna uh, ask Jean, we do have a Parkinson's community listening in. And they're, it's very interested, they're very interested in the progress that not only you have made in your laboratory, the state of California, and the general state of the research. Is there a trajectory for treatments and cures? What has been discovered in the time that CIRM has been around? Um, well, a lot. Um, I don't want to go into all the information about genomics and epigenetics, but that was really critical to us being able to make the right cells. Uh, the cells that need to be replaced in Parkinson's disease are dopamine neurons, and the dopamine neurons need to be developed to a, a very precise stage in a culture dish so they can be transplanted um, and, uh, and survive well and re innervate the brain. So a lot of our work has gone into perfecting that process and um, it has been a very uh, long journey. It was uh, launched, as I said earlier, by Summit for Stem Cell, not CIRM, but CIRM has helped since. Um, the uh, trajectory I think is good. Um, uh, Aspen Neuroscience, it's, it's very hard to predict now with uh, the pandemic, everything is gonna be later than we'd hoped, but 
uh, we we have plans at Aspen to um, to have a to start the phase one clinical trial, which is a safety trial. Uh, Kristen is is uh, familiar with uh, that concept. In um, about a year, a bit over a year, um, that may or may not happen depending on the circumstances. But there are other groups um, around the world. There's one in New York. There's one in Japan. There's one in Europe, who are taking similar approaches. Um, our approach is different in that we're um, we're going to transplant um, induced pluripotent stem cell derived neurons rather than embryonic stem cell derived neurons. And the reason for that is so they will be matched to the person who receives the cells and we won't have to immunosuppress the patients. So we're using iPS technology, which um, I know we didn't talk about, but um, it's a way of making cells that are just like embryonic stem cells from everybody, from anybody. So uh, you can have a matched cell line. Those cells were not available at the time when CIRM uh, was started. And That's as a correct, result yes. of research at CIRM and, of course, the Nobel Prize to Shinya Yamanaka, who also has uh, a seat at, at Gladstone, I believe, um, mm -hmm. uh, has created this new way of uh, creating pluripotent cells that can turn into any kind of cell in the human body. Is that a fair summary, right. Gene? Yeah, that's good. And I, I have to note that before a lot of what we learned about pluripotency, the, the ability to make every cell type in the body, we learned from embryonic stem cells. We weren't waiting around for this, this something we hadn't anticipated, which was a, a way of making pluripotent stem cells from individual people. Um, embryonic stem cells come from fertilized embryos that are um, in excess from IVF procedures. So essentially, they're medical waste, um, but they were extremely valuable in their early days uh, just to try to figure out what these cells could do and what, what they were capable of and um, how we could direct them to make the right cell types. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would, uh, we have a question. Uh, let, Melissa, this is for you. Um, uh, can the state of California afford the Proposition 14, and I think uh, to David's point, David summarized it uh, in an excellent way, those that have opposed it, and they've also raised that question as well. Uh, thank you for that, Bernie, and thank you to the attendee who asked the question. The question that, that I would pose in response to that is, can we afford not to pass Prop 14 and renew funding for CIRM? And the, the question is clearly an economic one, but the, the second question that I would ask, especially given some of what you've heard from our wonderful panel today is, what is the value of a human life? I can tell you that 50 babies have been saved from having a fatal disease, skid, baby bubble, severe combined immune deficiency. deficiency. They're born with no immune system. They will likely die as young children at best, and they've been saved in a clinical trial at UCLA that is at least in part funded by CERN, the research. And so those two questions I, I would pose to anyone asking me this question, can we afford not to economically? And I'll, I'll speak to that, but then think, think to yourself, what is the value of the life of just one of those babies? What's the value of Kristen being able to see again? What's the value of people like Judy's husband not having to suffer with and die from Huntington's disease because we can find a way by using stem cells to study it and then maybe using a combination of stem cell research plus gene therapy to cure it. What's, what, what's the value of that life and, and the many lives going forward of people who will suffer with and die with chronic diseases? But to get back to the economic question, how can we afford not to do this? Think of the billions of dollars that just the state of California alone spends on healthcare. Think of, perhaps, perhaps you've spoken to someone, I've spoken to many people, think of the number of people and families that go bankrupt dealing with a chronic disease or illness in their family. And then let's talk about Prop 14, specifically Prop 14. Prop 14, first of all, if the concern is about doing this now because we have a questionable economy given the situation with COVID, 
Um, I'd like to note, first of all, how nimble CERN can be and the value of having such a, an extremely well-run agency, being able to turn on a dime at a time when they're running out of funds and fund several grants that are doing amazing work toward studying, learning more about COVID, and potentially finding better treatments than the ones that are available right now. But economically, Prop 14 will not cost the state anything for the first five years after it is passed. And what I mean by that is the agency will get bond funding from the state, but the state will not pay anything toward those bonds for five years. So what this is, is an economic stimulus program for the state. You, you heard me talk earlier about job, jobs being driven by CIRM. Research is certainly driven forward and that takes people to carry out the research. There, there are many jobs in biotech that have been driven by it. So right when we need it most, this is economic stimulus that will not cost the state anything. So it doesn't compete with any other cost that the state must incur, whether that's for healthcare for the elderly or education or roads. Think of everything that goes into the state budget. None of that will be in competition with the funding for this agency for the first five years. And then when the state does have to start paying toward it, hopefully we'll be out of this economic problem by then that we're in right now because of COVID, but also it's still a tiny fraction of the annual state budget. So yes, there's a cost. It's undeniable. Research has to be paid for. The NIH it, research is paid for by the federal government. But it won't, there won't be a cost for the first five years. And the offsetting of the costs, economic and personal, that come from chronic illness and disease, you can't really put a price tag on that. When I think about it, I think we should be asking for more than 5.5 billion, but, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I would, respect, I would respectfully observe that we can't count on the federal government to do this task. I had cut you off, uh, David, when you were making your last point, only because I wanted to make sure I got to the other speakers, but is there any comment that you have or uh, you didn't get a chance to address in your remarks? I can't hear you, David. Not by surprise, not by surprise. I have to unmute myself. I'll, I'll, I'll join you in learning this technology. Um, the, uh, yeah, one of the things that I think is really important to think about here is the sustainability issue um, and that is posed by the proposition that was posed by Proposition 71. And, what, you know, the question is, is what happens after 10 or 15 more years? This $5.5 .5 billion is going to run out. Uh, and how does the agency proceed? Uh, and I think that's a question that doesn't get addressed very often by the opponents and the supporters. Uh, and unfortunately, I wish it had been taken care of in the initiative. But it's something that uh, some, some people who think about policy issues, it was raised by the uh, Institute of Medicine in their $700,000 study of the agency, and also by the Little Hoover Commission. But, you know, I do think that one of the important things about this is uh, in, in terms of of what the agency produces, and which is very much a topic of, of this particular panel, is uh, the question of hope. And it's, uh, it particularly struck me uh, because I think one of the important products of the agency is hope. It provides hope for uh, thousands and thousands of patients who are not uh, uh, seeing a lot of hope or haven't seen a lot of hope. And I think it's better expressed by Kristen and Judy and others uh, about that. But there's a little little uh, 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 coda to that. And that the uh, headquarters of, Oak, of the stem cell agency is located in downtown Oakland on Harrison Street, across from Lake Merrick. And as you walk towards that agency, or to the building that houses the agency, on, which is uh, where it has uh, offices on the 16th floor, at the ground level, the street level, you would literally pass a bank that is named a bank of hope. I appreciate that comment so much. Uh, I'm going to tell you folks that the key word about Prop 14 and SPERM is vision. Vision. This is an extraordinary state agency, unlike anything in the world. It is 
just completely different. The California economy and biotechnology and medical science, it's a huge industry. It's like a country in and of itself. I think it's like the fifth largest economy. Melissa, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. This is a treasure for the state. It is so extraordinary. And to create it and to tr try to create a board that has all of the agents, all of the recipients, all the universities, patient advocates, that has a sunset position is basically run by under 50 people by the terms of the proposition itself is astonishing. It was driven from a patient advocacy perspective, driven to get the job done. And what we didn't know in 2004 were the honest to goodness obstacles with the regulatory system as it is, that this is a paradigm shift and the way a whole new platform of medicine, it's mind boggling. And this is now a geopolitical issue. Other countries are pouring money into this. And not only that, with the advent of CRISPR in gene editing, nanotechnology, microscopy, the information age, all of these tools that have come into, into being right now, bioprinting, these things were just dreams, many of these in 2004. Now they're tools in the toolkit. Scientists are communicating all over the world to advance this field in an extraordinary way. Frederick Douglass says, power seeds nothing without a demand. Never has, never will. This is an advocacy movement like a consumer movement. The ordinary person, if you ask them, do you support stem cell research? Do you support the field of regenerative medicine? And they will say yes, not because they're some scientist or they necessarily remember their 10th grade biology, but they, can, they see it not as some public health issue, but as a personal health issue, something that impacts their lives, their families' lives, and their friends. At a time of existential crisis on all of these fronts, this is the moment where California voters can seize the moment, realize that they have something unique in the world, a jewel in the crown of advocacy. We can't count on the federal government, but California innovation leads the way. I don't live in California, but I wish I did to be able to vote on this. I appreciate all of you that have been on this webinar and those that have paid attention to this in this attentive audience, which has not fallen off. I appreciate it very much. I know our hosts do, and I want to thank our patient advocates. And I hope I have some, because the time is limited. If you have a last word you'd like to say, uh, Kristen or Judy, I'll throw the floor open to you for some final remarks, please. Uh, Kristen? You know, I love that you hit the word vision because um, I have a, a website called secondvision.net. It's about recreating your life's vision when the first one fails. And I always like to thank Bob Klein, the author, yeah. because he's such, the author of Prop 71, because he's such a visionary in the world. So I guess that's what I'd like to say. So keep the vision for tomorrow. I keep mine that I, I often think of what my life would have been like had I been able to see. And now I can't stop but thinking, what would it be like with stem cell that enabled me to see all of you right now? Thank you, Kristen. Judy? Uh, what an experience this day has been, just to be able to express our gratitude to, I know Melissa from way back. Um, or maybe since 2007, when I first attended, and the public's invited to attend the board meetings for a CIRM, and I encourage people to show up, see the dedication yourself, and um, a lot of the labs will invite families to go visit. I encourage that too. Uh, it is very moving to actually see cells under the microscope living active cells and um i just want to thank everyone for their hard work and this is truly hope please vote yes i please vote yes for this just believe that it will please vote yes on proposition 14. there's so many sick people counting on this funding so i remember now you have to do a poll 
All right, you've heard the webinar. Please let's see if uh, let's see if our hosts are going to be able to pop up the poll screen to ask if anyone's changed their mind. We have that. Yeah. Yes, we do. So let's uh, call the webinar closed and thank you very much for attending. Thank you to our hosts. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you all. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you everyone. Thank Thanks, you, Bernie. Thank you, everybody. It's good to see you all. Yes, you too.